What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview. First off, thank you so much for tuning in, for checking out the show. Um, your support is massively, massively appreciated. The only reason that this show exists is because of all of your amazing support. So we truly appreciate your support. I truly appreciate your support. Make sure that you're sharing the show with as many people that you feel would benefit from the show. The goal is to always grow this show and go out there and have a big impact. Real quick though, before we jump into today's podcast, I want to plug our sponsors that make all of this possible. Our first sponsor is my personal 90-day mastery boot camp. This is my real estate agent mentorship training program. Um, it's a group training platform. This way it makes it extremely affordable for you. Inside this program, however, um, I am unpacking my entire playbook. I'm walking you through step by step everything that I do inside my real estate business, everything that I've done, everything I've learned um, in my 12 plus year career with selling over 5,000 homes, with selling over a billion dollars in real estate. Um, and I walk you through step by step exactly what I've done, how I built what I've built, um, and what I'm doing today to go out there and create the success. But don't mistake the low cost. Um, for low value. This is an insanely in-depth, step-by-step program um, where I'm walking you through, again, step-by-step on how I go out there. My team sells one to two homes every single day in today's market, continue to grow my business year after year, and how I've been able to exit from selling, exit from actually day-to-day involvement in my real estate team and create an epic, amazing real estate team that not only sustains but grows without my involvement. So whatever level that you're at, whether you're a brand new real estate agent, agent, you're an a individual high producing agent that wants to expand and create a team, or if you already have an amazing team or your broker owner that's looking to step up your internal training, looking to step up your systems, your processes, your tracking, make your business more predictable, this program is absolutely for anybody that's serious about leveling up inside their business. So check us out, www.90daymastery.com. Uh, make sure you use promo code Live Mastery, all one word, all together, all caps. That's going to get you the biggest discount on 90mastery.com. You're going to see tons of testimonials on their video testimonials, what's included in the program, the future dates of the program. I do several of these every single year, so make sure to check us out and make sure to jump inside that program ASAP. Uh, my next uh, uh, next sponsor that makes this uh, uh, show possible is perfectstormnow.com. If you're a real estate agent and you are looking for a lead generation machine website, backed by an insanely powerful CRM system that allows you to convert your leads to appointments at the highest possible level, manage all your tasks, make sure that you're effective and efficient as you possibly can be inside your business, transaction management component, all of that stuff. It is hands down by far the most effective and affordable real estate website and CRM program that exists out there in the industry. It's what I use to go out there and sell 650 plus homes every single year and the system is gnarly. If you're signing up for that program, Make sure to use promo code MASTERY, P-S-N, all caps, all one word, all together. That'll save you the $200 registration fee and get you a great discount. Um, our last sponsor is REO University. So I teamed up with a good buddy of mine who is the most knowledgeable dude, hands down, that I've ever met when it comes to REO properties. This guy used to work for the, the banks directly as an asset manager, um, and uh, he developed so many of the systems that you see that asset managers and asset management firms and banks used today. Um, this guy sold over 11,000 properties, foreclosure properties as an asset manager. And he and I teamed up um, with my experience of, of working with over 35 banks in my career, selling thousands of REOs plus his experience. We've created an, uh, uh, just an insane program. Again, um, REO University, the website is www.reo.com reo mastery university um it's a one-time payment for 997 or you can split that up into three monthly payments uh this is not a live boot camp like my 90 mastery boot camp this is something that you have access to instantaneously we we'll walk you through exactly how to go out there and get in with the banks um so how to get the business but then how to service that business at the highest level um how to go out there and complete bpos how to complete cash for keys how to how to make sure that you're insane at your valuations how to go out there and, and uh, make sure that 
your asset managers are winning and hitting their goals, key indicators you need to look for, and more. There's 22 in-depth, um, just amazing, powerful modules that will teach you how to become an REO machine inside your real estate business. Now, if you're like me, I don't want my business to ever be in a vulnerable position, right? I don't care if it's a good market, bad market. It doesn't mean that my business needs to be good or bad. My business can always be great. During a market crash, right, there's no such thing as if the market's going to crash. It's just a matter of when, right? But again, you don't need to put yourself in a vulnerable position. You can make sure that your real estate business is 100% recession proof um, and go out there and of course, generate business, do a ton of business regardless of what's happening in the marketplace. And this is exactly how you go out there and do it. And we walk you through step by step. So check us out, reomasteryuniversity.com. You can learn more about the program, hopefully register for the program, jump on in. Um, this price will not last long, right? We just created this product, rolled it out uh, several months ago, and uh, just getting in the hands of the consumer, and people are having a lot of amazing success. So again, check us out, reomasteryuniversity.com. All right, again, you guys, thank you so much for watching this show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to share the show. Make sure to comment, uh, um, um, you know, like us on YouTube, leave some positive comments. We love hearing back from you guys um, and love getting your feedback. Keep kicking ass and let's jump on in to today's interview. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smithy with another GSD Mode interview where every single week we interview top entrepreneurs, top real estate agents, and just straight up top badasses out there dominating their spaces. They're people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, their families, as well as have a big impact on others while they exist. So to you guys, we got another rock star, amazing, special guest on the show. So our guest today, you guys, is a top realtor, top team leader in Atlanta. Um, in 2017, she had the top uh, sale out of her whole entire firm at uh, $1,950,000, which is uh, – vastly supersedes my highest sell, so I'm a little jealous here, uh, um, has been called the Jedi Master of Hashtags, which I'm excited to get into that. Um, and also, you guys, uses video uh, um, and technology very, very effectively uh, effectively to go out there and attract national and international buyers. So, um, really stoked and honored to have Tori Easterling on the show, my, show, my friend. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? And thank you for that introduction. Yeah, no, doing awesome. I'm stoked to have you on. This is going to be a lot of fun. Right, let's get to it. Yeah, so you know, before we get into what you're doing next, I know you're doing a lot of a lot of uh, uh, amazing things. I mean, you're you're, you're obviously you're, you're growing your team, you're expanding. You guys are doing big things there. Um, you're doing a lot of uh, uh, kind of innovative things, if you will, and leveraging social media and technology really well. You know, but I, before we get into all of that, I'm always intrigued in our guest journeys that let them down this journey in the first place. You know, like, like if you rewind the clocks, like what led you into entrepreneurship and ultimately into the real estate industry in the first place? Awesome. Well, um, I will say what got me into entrepreneurship was when I was a teenager, my parents were into multi-level marketing before the communications business deregulated. So I used to have to go to these meetings with, you know, multi-level marketing. You can have whatever you want in this world. It's a numbers game, Les Brown, you know, Tony Robbins. So I got exposed to that when I was around 12. Um, and real estate actually was my plan since I was maybe around that same age. I had an aunt who was a math teacher and a real estate agent on the side. And during the summer and winter months, she would have these big closings and these checks. And I was like, hey, I wanna do that too. And um, so I went to college to be a high school math teacher because I was just gonna follow what she did um, because I admired her. And I went, I went ahead and was like, hey, I'm in college, but I can go get a real estate license while I'm studying to be a teacher. And of course, that was 2005, 2006. I got my license and got my clothes, you know, got started in the business. I was like, yeah, about that classroom mm -hmm. stuff. Um, yeah, you know, I'll do that later and do real estate now. Um, and that was 2006. And then of course the market crashed, but I hadn't been licensed that long. So I didn't really get, um, the gravity of the situation. So I just kept working, made it through that. And, um, and here I am. So I'm kind of, uh, working my dream job, if you will, in that I planned to do it from when I was a kid and I got that entrepreneurial spirit putting me in middle school. And so 
you know, working for someone else, even though I have done that, it's always been my goal to, um, you know, have my own and have control of my own life. Yeah. Now I love it. You know, it's so awesome to get that level of clarity at such a young age, you know, cause I mean, it's very, very rare. I don't know. And you know, I, I've interviewed a lot of realtors on here. I don't know if I've ever had anybody that, that had that clarity at that young of an age. That, that's pretty epic. Um, you know, so, okay. So you get in the business at 2006 when the, when the market's crashing and, and, you know, um, what's cool about that. And we got into business around the same time. And it's like, when you get into it, yeah, you, you, you're so new, you're kind of reinventing yourself every day anyway. So you don't really know what's going on. You don't have bad habits yet. You're not comfortable yet. And, um, but let, let's talk about that, right? Cause we're in an industry where 90% of real estate agents fell in the first three years. Um, and especially, I mean, I mean, mar- I mean that, that market was n- nasty, you know, right? So like, what did you do out of the gate, especially like you're jumping in, like you're the firefighter, you're jumping in when everybody else is running the other direction and leaving the business, right? So like, what, what did that first year or a couple years look like? Like, how did you go out there and create success initially and not become a statistic? Well, what I did is um, pretty much what I do now. I made sure that I I read a lot of books. I went to a lot of trainings, and on, honestly, being fully transparent, my first year was a it wasn't really that awesome. I didn't have it as great of a first year as you did. When I got in the business, I went and worked for my girlfriend's firm, which is awesome, and she still runs it. Um, but I was new, and I needed support, and I was shadowing. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing, so I quickly um, shifted to a you know a company that had more um, training, a, a bigger company, and I went there. And when I walked in the door, I just asked the agent, I mean, the broker, who's number one? <laughs> and I said, who's number one? And he told me her name. And I said, okay, great. I'm going to work with her. And he was like, well, she already has an assistant and yeah, she's not hiring. I said, okay, well, that's great. I'm going to work for her. She's number one. So I'll figure it out. And, um, in my first office, we had two floors and downstairs was kind of like the common folks and upstairs was, you know, where the top producers were, and I shimmied my way up there somehow and found me a cubicle right outside of her office, and I camped out there, and it was just kind of like, well, let me know what you need, and back then, she was the top agent in the area. She was working with all the celebrities and athletes, and she had all of the subdivisions and new construction, and I just decided, she's number one. I'm not going to, you know, try to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to find out what she did and um, learn from her, and ultimately, I think after maybe about six months to a year, she brought me on her team. So early on in my career, I got exposure to luxury. I got exposure to, you know, dealing with confidentiality agreements and, you know, just dealing with high net worth individuals, um, which is what I focus on still today. But that's what I did in my first year. I just went and um, went after the top producers and tried to emulate their activities. So I got the habits of lead generation, you know, following a schedule. That was something that she instilled in me, following the schedule. Um, She used to make me call her clients every Monday morning. So that's something that I still carry in my business. She would say, um, if your clients are calling you, you're not doing your job. So uh, I learned a lot of great things um, from her, still keep in touch with her to this day. Of course, when the market crashed, you know, we split, you know, we tried to hang on and whatnot, whatnot, and then we split up. But, um, yeah, that's where I got everything from. I just went straight to the top. I don't, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Now, have you, I mean, have you always been like that, like just driven, take the bull by the horns, like <laughs> never take a no for an answer. Like just like the broker, like you're, you're, you know, especially when you're new, you think your broker's your boss. And they're like, no, you, that's like, you have a chance. And you're like, I don't care what you say. I'm going for this. You know, I mean, have you always had that kind of inner drive? I have, Joshua. I mean, again, being fully transparent, where I came from, it, I just didn't grow up with a, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon. But I still knew, like, this can't be life, and there's there's an alternative to this way of living. So at a very young age, I started investigating and getting curious about what people outside of my community were doing. And um, I think in fourth grade, a teacher invited me to her place, and that was my first exposure to life outside of the, you know, outside of the hood or what have you. And I'm like, oh, people are living differently than I'm living. So I started getting curious and I started getting my parents to take me to open houses as a kid. So it's always been, you know, that's always been how I am. And then with the the big sale that I had, I just woke up one day and said, hey, I want to go work in Buckhead, which is the most prestigious part of town here in Atlanta. And 
I literally just said, why not? Why can't I work in, you know, work in this building? And I, I declared it pretty much and went after it. So I have always been that way and people think I'm nuts. Um, my broker, even here at my company, he's just like, well, Tori, you gotta, you know, you gotta take these steps to get, I'm like, yeah, no, I, I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going after, you know, I'm going there, you know, and so I don't know what that is or how I ended up with that trait. It yeah. doesn't always work out, lots of failure, of course, um, which is a good thing for me. Yeah, no, I love it. So, and then you talked about, okay, you got clarity that you wanted to work for this top producer. But I mean, you were like hanging there and just like, like going after this opportunity. And I don't know how, how exactly it went, like getting turned down or getting told no, but for a year before you got brought on, you know, right? Um, like what kept you driving in it? You know, because a lot of people would be like, hey, man, maybe after, most people would like hang on for two weeks or a month and be like, right. okay, screw this, I'm going to do another opportunity. Like, like I mean, what, what was kind of happening at that point? Like, how, how did you hang on for a year? Well, during that year, I wasn't just kind of hanging. I was, I was actually helping out. So I was just, I was working, doing my lead generation, prospecting, calling for sale by owners. I was working my business in that cubicle outside of her office. But if there was an opportunity, she had an assistant. If they needed, you know, someone to go on site and fill in at the subdivision, I would go. If they needed, so, and I wasn't getting paid for these things. I just wanted the experience working with high net worth individuals and doing a lot of volume. So I was working my business, but if they needed me to do anything, I was there. So I was kind of like the, I always call it, um, have you seen The Devil Wears Prada? I was Emily number two. So I was just kind of, you know, you know, put me on wherever and I was just there, but I was still lead generating. I was still listing properties. Um, you know, I was still working on my own. So it wasn't like I was just kind of hanging out. Um, and in retrospect, maybe I could have come in and just did it on my own, but I was just, um, I didn't, being that I came from where I came from, I had some limiting beliefs around me being able to do it myself. And I thought, you know, hey, let me just go to someone who knows what they're doing so that I can learn how to, you know, so that I can learn my way around. Yeah, I love it, love it, love it. So then, you know, you said, okay, so the market then fully crashes, you know, REOs are hitting, short sales are hitting, and, and you know, you kind of talked about that. You tried to hang on, but eventually it dissolved, and, and you know, you went your separate ways. And, and you know, if I, if I remember reading correctly, I mean, it sounds like you still, um, you know, have some REO accounts and still do some REO today, but how, how did you transition? Because a lot of people didn't read the writing on the wall and couldn't pivot and couldn't transition into that space. I mean, did you get in that? I mean, how did that come about? Um, well, yeah, a lot of people couldn't pivot and she was one of them. If you're doing all of this money, you know, all of this volume and business, a lot of her clients lost a lot of money. Like these people had put up a lot of their money and then like, she just, she didn't know what to do. And all, you know, people who in the higher price points, they were no longer buying or selling. They couldn't sell. Um, and so there was, honestly, there was a, um, a receptionist in our office and she said, you know, do you do BPOs? And I'm like, BPOs, what's that? <laughs> and she said, well, you go and you do these reports for these companies, these asset managers, and, um, and then they pay you to do these reports and these drive-by inspections. And she was talking about property preservation. And I was just like, what? And, um, so I went to the internet and just started again, getting curious and, um, making inquiries with these companies like what do I do how do I sign up so I went I had a list of about 150 BPO companies and I don't know if you remember but I just would go down the list and apply and they make you fill out these huge packages and you never hear anything bad um, but yeah that's how I learned about it I didn't know it before but this receptionist was just like hey you may want to look into this and I did and honestly Joshua um, that supported my business. I mean, that supported me for a few years. I was, I was making several thousand dollars a month just doing BPOs. Um, and then, you know, had an opportunity to list a few properties. Of course, we turn into listings after you do so much good work for the company. So that's how I got there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, I don't know if you experienced this, but, you know, pre REO, you know, I, I mean, I had, you know, systems and, and some processes, but man, when you get into REO, it, it, it's a whole different world, you know, right? Um, and you really, especially if you're handling bomb, you really got to get your systems dialed in. And, you know, I, I mean, it changed my life, right? Like I, I it, it, 
the, what I learned from REO, that experience, I mean, it's one of the hardest experiences because you're, you're, you know, you could be a human punching bag at time for these, you know, asset managers and right. you just got to take it on the chin. But man, I mean, the system processes and, and dialing in, you know, each aspect of your business, um, you know, for me personally, it was just such a game changer and, and exposed me to a whole new way of thinking. You know, did you, did you experience that as well going through that experience? I can't say that I did because honestly, I didn't get a lot of listings. I got a couple, but I, didn't, I wasn't doing listing volumes. The bulk of what I was doing was BPOs and you still have to have your systems in place. They want these orders in, they've got deadlines. So in that regard, um, I did get the systems in place. The, but the biggest impact to my business from doing that was that I became a market expert. I can literally price property in my sleep. I can drive down a street and it's just like, oh, that one's 525. That one's five. You know, I can, and I say that on my listing presentations now, I don't do BPOs. I still have the companies and I'll, you know, I try to keep my relationships open because, you know, what's coming. Um, <laughs> But, you know, when I go on my listing appointments, I tell them, hey, listen, I was a contractor for Wells Fargo for three years while the market was depressed. And I, you know, I let them know what the value of the properties are. So what I'm telling you is fact. This is what they're looking at. These are the comps they're going to consider. They're going to send someone out here to take, you know, so I let them know um, what's going on. And that's the biggest thing that I got from working um, the BPO REO side. I wasn't doing volume with listings. Yep. Yep. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, those that are maybe watching or listening to that or that are newer and didn't experience that, um, you know, BPO is essentially, I mean, it's, it's an appraisal report, you know, right. Uh, um, that you're going through and, and yeah, it forces you that market knowledge. I mean, you're, you're, you're forced to, to get it down really quickly, um, which is awesome. So, you know, I know today, I mean, you, you're, you know, you're operating a team now, um, you know, kind of walk us through, I mean, at, at what point did the team transition and, and then kind of walk us through, you know, what the team looks like today? Got it. Well, here again, here's Tori, you know, thinking big. <laughs> so I went to my coach and I'm not doing any volume. I'm like, hey, I think I want to build a team. And um, my coach at this time, she was just like, you can't, you can't, you don't have enough going on to have a team. And I said, well, listen, I'm a mother. At the time I had three kids. I'm like, I'm a mother of three. I can't be out showing buyers. Like, I just can't be driving around town. I don't have that kind of time. And so she just said, you can't have a team. You've got to do it this way. And I said, okay. And I went my, <laughs> I went my own way. And so for me, starting a team was more about just not letting buyers fall through the cracks because I would just like not take a buyer. I would just be like, I can't take, I can't take them out because I've got to go to tennis practice and basketball practice and, you know, do all of these things. So I um, work for Keller Williams and we have our profit tree model, um, profit share tree model. And so I was thinking, I already have these agents who are under me or, you know, in my, in my tree or what have you. And why don't I bring them in, try to develop them? They can work with these buyers. This is money that I'm leaving on the table anyway. Um, and so that's what it started. Um, that's how it started for me with the team. I just didn't want my friends and family to not be serviced. And I knew that I, I, I was not equipped to do it myself. So I skipped the, I think our models go, you hire an, an assistant first. And I do recommend for any new agents, hire the assistant first. I did it wrong. Um, I'm not wrong. I did it my way and it doesn't really work that way. You need that assistant to get the systems and whatnot in place and to support the new staff. But I brought on the buyer's agents to handle the buyers. So that's how I got there. Um, and then of course there were some breakdowns because I didn't have the admin. I didn't have the foundation set and there were breakdowns. And now I'm back rebuilding the org chart, chart getting the assistant, getting the transaction coordinator, and most importantly, the buyer's agents, because that's what sucks up most of our time in this business, working with buyers and driving them around. Um, and I find that new agents are okay with working with buyers. A lot of agents aren't as confident to go on listing appointments because they don't know the market yet. So um, that's what got me going in the team direction. So right now, I'm just, I've got an org chart and I'm just like an organizational chart where I'm just like, these spots need to be filled because ultimately I'm trying to get like you <laughs> to where I can kind of step back and I'm not having to go on all of the appointments and do everything on my own. 
And um, I think that that's really where it said a lot of agents are just like, I got to do everything myself. Even some of the top, top, top agents, we try to do everything ourselves and that just doesn't work over, over time. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Yeah. No, and I, and I love that you brought the, the assistant thing, you know, and I mean, it's a mistake that we see so often and, and, and what happens and I get why in theory in our heads, it sounds good, but then you become the assistant, you know, right. And, and, and then it just, the, the breakdown is just insane. So, um, you know, talk, talk to us about, you know, I know you were, uh, uh, you know, kind of given the name, the Jedi master of hashtags, you know, right. So, so kind of, I mean, how did that come about? And, and, you know, I got to assume by that name that you're going out there and you're doing some pretty, um, you know, pretty epic stuff, uh, uh, you know, with hashtags, with social media to go out there and, and grow your exposure, grow your brand, grow your business. So, you know, kind of walk us through how it came about and what you're doing, um, you know, with social media to continue to grow and expand. Yeah. So I've been on social media since Facebook was for college students. I don't want to tell my age, but that's when I first got on social media and well, no, actually it was my space. Right. So, <laughs> so but I was on Facebook and you know, people were just like, you know, you're on social media too much. You're on social media too much. And I was like, yeah, no, actually I'm making money here. So I started before hashtags were even a thing. I started just being active on Facebook. This is before Instagram, just being active, letting people know what I'm doing. I used to take pictures of my feet when I was showing properties, I would take my shoes off and just like, Oh, another property. Um, and I, I just got the social I got that people are fascinated by the most ridiculous things you know like taking your shoes off during a showing you know we love food pics and all of that and so then when Twitter and hashtag um, Twitter and Instagram came along with hashtags it was just like oh my gosh I can use this to connect with my tribe or whoever's talking about the same thing that I'm talking about so the Jedi master of the hashtag came um, I did a, a, another podcast interview with the Atlanta Real Estate Forum, and um, I think that I made contact with them through using hashtags, so I will just go for hours and just research hashtags and find out who's posting on this hashtag. So I have the 34 agents in my profit share tree. I look at the Atlanta Real Estate hashtag, and I look at what are these people posting? What are they liking? How are they engaging with the hashtag? And so... I study them. I switch them up maybe every four to six weeks. Um, I try something out if nobody's talking about it. I don't, you know, I no longer look at it. So for example, now I'm working with investors. So, you know, I'm looking at the hashtag, let's say driving for dollars. So um, I just figured out that's a way to reach my tribe or the people that I want to reach. So when I'm looking to list condos, I'm not looking at the hashtag book at condos. I'm looking up um, things that a consumer might be looking at, which is, you know, hashtag penthouse view, right? Um, hashtag penthouse view, but I just go into the mind of the consumer. I go into my mind when I'm looking up things, um, you know, like red handbags. I'm into red handbags and red couches. I mean, you'd be surprised how many, like, networks of people there are out there hashtagging certain things. And I... I just really spend a lot of time in that space and I'm able to connect with people who have similar interests, which I think is part of the social media aspect that people miss. You know, you, some people think you can just show up on social media and start talking to people. And it doesn't really work that way. You have to have something in common and hashtags allow you to do that. Yeah. Love it. So, so somebody that's maybe listening to this, right. That, that has never in their, you know, whether life or business life is went out there and, and utilized hashtags in an intentional manner. You know, I mean, you gave us some examples there, but then, okay. Like if I, you got the hashtag driving for dollars, you're going after investors. Like then once you, I mean, number one, how do you discover these hashtags like and, and what's popular what's trending and and you know knowing that that hashtag meets the avatar that you're looking for then from there once you identify it you know right um because i think it's awesome how you talked about hey when i'm showing a home i'll do a picture of my feet where most realtors might just do a picture of the house oh showing it like people get sick of that they don't want to see that you know right so so then once you discover that how do you how do you bring in you know, like you're bringing in real estate, but then you're bringing in personal to develop that human connection. And, and, you know, it just seems like you're doing such a brilliant job at it. You know, what kind of tips and advice would you have for our listeners? Um, well, first off to answer the first part of the question, how do I know what hashtags to look for? 
I just think about me as a consumer. If I am, for example, I have an iPhone, so I look up the hash code the hashtag iPhoneography. Like I take pictures, you know, we have the portrait mode now. So I'm like, oh, okay, I want to know who else is taking pictures of, you know, who's, who else is excited about portrait mode. So I may do hashtag portrait mode. Now I'm connected to an entire community of iPhone users who have portrait mode. So when I get that, when I get there, you know if it's an active hashtag by, if you're on Instagram, it shows you how many people are talking about it. So if I go there and it's like only 200 people talking about portrait mode, not really popping, right? But if I go there and there are 10,000 people talking about it, okay, now we have a tribe. If I go there and there are a million people talking about it, that's too big of an audience. So I kind of stay in the 10,000 to 30,000 range in terms of who's using the hashtag because it's small enough for me to engage and not too big. So then once I'm there, I look at who's posting, you know, who's posting, who's liking, who's commenting. So I literally just go through the post and see who's liking and then that connects me with other people who are interested. So then I'll follow them, I'll look at their page, I'll engage on their page. And ideally, it's not just about liking, I don't like, you have to engage. So commenting, or, um, you know, again, finding some common interest, you know, we have iPhone mode, you may ask a question, how did you get this shot, nice shot, what have you, that person comes at your pace, they see you're into the same thing. And now we have a relationship. Once you have that relationship, then you can kind of take it offline and start a, you know, start an actual conversation. And for me, you know, I go straight to the source. So if you've got your phone number or your email address, I'm contacting you. Hey, you know, hey, it's Tori. We're friends. We follow each other on Instagram. You know, if they're local, I talk to them. If they're not local, I talk to them because I help people all over the country through my referral sources. Um, so that's how I use the hashtags to actually make it turn into business. Um, and then the second part of your, well, remind me, what was the second part of your question? Yeah, and I, and I apologize. Sometimes I just rattle them off because I'm like, I know I'm going to forget <laughs> if I don't. Uh, uh, um, is Okay, so then you identify it, um, you know, but then, okay, so you, and you talked to, you know, how, how you initiate the human connection. And I love it, right? Because you know, they were not in the real estate business with the human connection, human resource business, right? So, you know, you're initiating that, that human connection. And, and, um, but then from there, like, what are you posting where it's not just the traditional real estate stuff that okay. people are just going to get annoyed with, you know, right? Like how, how do you engage them? So you have this human connection, but also you're kind of subtly planting those seeds that, Hey, I'm also a real estate agent. Yeah. So social media one-on-one, don't try to sell people stuff. People don't want to be sold to on social media. Um, I went to a Facebook class like maybe 10 years ago and the guy said, you're at a cocktail party. So I look at it like I'm at a cocktail party. So I'm posting while I'm at work, but I'm not posting by this house, by this house, work with me, work with me. Now that's sprinkled in there, but it's literally like 20% of what I post. Of course, if I get a new listing, I post that. Um, if I have a sale, I post those, but more so it's just like, um, you know, anything out of the ordinary that I'm, that I'm seeing when I'm out. So I post a lot of pictures of me walking into the homes. People are interested in kind of like what's real. People don't want to be looking at your flyer. They don't care about the flyer. They want to know, like, they want to be in the action and feel like they're involved. So the pictures of my feet. It's just like, hey, when I walk into people, what I'm saying is when I walk into people's houses, I take my shoes off and I'm working. So they know that I'm working if they see my toes, right? Um, also, I had a client, wanted, you know, they wanted to know how big was the bathtub. So I got in the bathtub, like, okay. <laughs> like, people want that, they just don't want to be sold to. That's all, that's all it is. Or, you know, if I've got to switch from my heels to my boots, I don't know what it is with me and my feet. People are into that. Um, but, you know, if I'm switching shoes or, or I got mud on my shoes, I'm showing that. Or um, something really funny, back during my REO days, I had um, went to go do an inspection on a property and the windows, you know, these places used to be trash. And the window was bursted out. And as I'm undoing the lockbox and putting the key, a black cat jumps out of the window. <laughs> and, so, and this is in Georgia. So Atlanta is diverse, but you have some rural areas that are not so diverse. So I'm running down this rural street in Dallas, Georgia, which is like an hour outside of Atlanta, and I'm hightailing it down the street, just like, you know, and I'm screaming and I'm running, I'm afraid of cats. And, um, you know, it's just a vacant house with a bunch of trash. So 
I did a video back then. I did a video and a post about, you know, what happened in this scenario because everyone um, right now on social media, everybody's doing great. You know, everybody's a top realtor. Everybody's, you know, a millionaire listing person. Everybody's high kicking. And people just want what's real. And I post what's real. Like, life is not great. This is not glamorous. It gets dirty. It's, it gets nasty. You know, that's, that's the type of stuff that I post and people respond to it. And if they respond to it, then I keep giving them more of what they respond to. Yeah. No, I love it too. Cause I mean, the cool thing is too, is, is those that really do respond to it, you know, right. I mean, you're, you're, you're attracting clients that are connected with you. So I got to imagine then, I mean, it, it, it makes the industry so much more fun. You know, like, like you get to the point where it's like, man, I feel like I'm getting paid to just hang out with my friends and help them sell and buy real estate, you know, and it becomes a different game there. Um, so love it. So then, you know, I know that you're also doing a lot of, uh, of, of, you know, great things and effective things with video that you've incorporated in your business. So, so what are you doing with video and, and um, like what's really working for you there? Um, what's really working is using um, my, my biggest platform is Instagram. So most of what I do on in, is on Instagram. That's with new people. And then my Facebook, since I've been there since college, that's like my family and my friends and people that I know. It's not closed or anything, but that's just how the chips have fallen. So with video, you know, Instagram has Insta stories right now. I actually post more on, on my stories than I do on my actual um, feed. So, you know, I may post a flyer on my feed and keep in mind your news feed is what your clients are going to see when they come and start researching you before an appointment. So I make sure that my feed is very vanilla. I've got some pictures of my family, some real estate photos. It's very professional. I make sure that my grammar is correct. But then on the Instagram story with video, what people don't realize is that on video, people feel like they know you. They can hear you speak. So it's building that trust. So on my Instagram videos, like, you know, um, on Monday, I was pulling up the bold. I'm in bold now you know, rah, rah. I'm pulling up the bowl and I'm like, yes, I'm Tori and I'm bold. So I just went live. I didn't have anything to say. I just went live and I was pumped. I had gone to the gym at five 30 and everybody knows that I went, you know, like my community, they know that I, you know, work out at this gym and did the, you know, some boot camp. So they're like, Oh my gosh, boot camp must've been great this morning. I'm like, yeah. You know, and people just feel like they know you. And so when I meet people in person, like they talk to me like we actually know each other. It's just like, hey, Tori, or, you know, I say my name, I'm Tori, Tori Eastman. Oh my God, I follow you on Instagram. And people are like, they're engaged. And video gives people more than that little snapshot in time. And I think that it just builds trust and rapport. And, um, and again, I just keep it real. So on my story, you may see something that you may not see on my newsfeed, like a curse word may slip out, you know, get shit done today. You know, like on my story, that's where I am. So people are seeing that I'm human. Um, you know, if I have, I don't like to put bad stuff out. So I don't go on there. Like some agents will go on and talk about, you know, other agents or something that happened bad. I try not to do that. Um, but you know, if it's something that happened and it didn't work out, I share that experience. It's just like, oh my gosh, my appraisal just came in low, you know, sellers, this is what you need to do when your appraisal comes in low or, oh my gosh, wire fraud is going on. And it's not like a, okay, I have a professional message for you. It's just like, Hey guys, listen up. There are people out here hacking email accounts. When you're buying a house, make sure that you're not, you know, buying or selling, make, make sure that you're checking the wiring instructions with the attorney, just kind of giving them things of value, but keeping it very, what's another word that I can use besides, besides real, just keeping it very personable. So it's not so salesy, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think I think the general public is just you know starving, if you will, for authenticity. You know, because um, I mean, you said earlier, like everybody's pretending to be something that they're not. They're trying to be this baller, and you know, they're freaking broke, probably living in their mom's basement. Yeah. You know, right? I'm a recruiter, so I'm like this person has, and I only have maybe like three thousand followers, maybe. But there are people that have like 40 and however many followers and these people are just like, oh my God. I'm like, I'm a recruiter. I know what everybody in Atlanta is making. And that's not important, but it's just, it's just not, you know, people, I guess when they meet them, they learn that they're not really what they say they are on social media. And then they call me and they're like, hey, Tori, you know, this happened and this person is not professional 
um, you know, I get, I get, you know, they'll come to me and tell me what's going on. So I try to let people in and get to know me. And if I do make a mistake or if I do have some things that don't work out, I am the first person to say, Hey guys, this is what happened. And I think that that's why people trust me more. Um, than somebody out there who's just, you know, all, you know, I'm a top millionaire real estate agent. Like, it's not realistic to do that. And I don't think that the public responds to that. And I don't think that that's going to sustain another shift. Like when the market shifts again, all of those people are going to have to go back to their jobs because it's not going to fly. And then right now it's pretty much easy to sell a house, right? I mean, anybody can sell, you put a listing on, it's going to sell. But when the market shifts, you're going to have someone that knows what they're doing. Um, and I think that that's what I try to get through to my audience. I know what I'm doing and I'm here to protect your money. I'm here to protect your home, you know, and I just think that there's too much. I'm a top agent going on and I don't, I try not to dabble in that space. Yeah. You know, I get my props when I sell something nice, but it's not like, Oh, I'm the top agent in the world. I don't put on that. That's what I am. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I love it. So then, I mean, you know, to, to, do what you're doing here with all of this. I mean, you, 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 you've got to be very intentional with it, you know, right? I mean, a lot of people, and, and I'm, I'm as, when I say this, like, I'm not trying to be hypocritical here because I'm, I'm as guilty as, as most where, you know, I'll go hardcore with posting and, you know, like Instagram for a while. Like I went hardcore for a while and then it was just like, like six months and I was like, ah, you know, like, you, you got to be intentional, consistent with this and like, like how, what, what do you do to do that? I mean, are you blocking off like, Hey, you know, like every single day I've got to create X amount of content. I'm going to spend an hour a day just on this. Like you're treating it just like any other lead source. Like if I'm calling expires or whatever, you know, I mean, talk about to have success like you do with social media and these platforms. Um, you know, the intention of focus that it really takes. It, yeah, it definitely takes focus and intention. Again, on the outside looking in, it looks like, hey, she's just having fun on social media and she's posting. Well, no, actually, I'm posting X number of times a day. For me now, my, I used to do three times a day. Now I'm just like, just post one time a day, um, three to six times on my Instagram story per day. It's very intentional. I also use um, software to plan out my posts in advance. So I'll sit down. I'm doing it tomorrow in my office. I sit down and I plan my content for the whole month. This is what I'm talking about. I have my stock images already saved. I have my program that I use to make my posts, which is Canva. And it's just like, hey, this is what we're talking about. And you need to post. You can't leave your audience hanging. Um, and I even have a social media planner that I bought from another influencer on social media. She's uh, the six figure chick. She sells a planner where it's just like, what are we talking about this week? How many new followers do I want to get? Um, you know, she teaches you how to check your insights. There's a way when you have your business page on Instagram to check what's the best time to post. So I look at those things every day and say, okay, my audience is active between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. That's when I'm going to schedule my post. I put it into later when 3 p.m. comes later shoots me a message to go ahead and post my post. And I just click send. I have my hashtags already pre-made. So Instagram allows 30 hashtags. I have those already set in my phone. So I don't have to come up with hashtags every single time that I post. Most of us are too busy to sit around and do that. So I do mine and plan it out in advance. And then my story is just kind of like, you know, my story is more organic. Um, but yeah, it's very intentional. And people think that, you know, you're just on social media. Like, no, it's, it's very intentional. And then I have what's called, I don't know if you've heard of the 15th protocol, right? So the 15th of the month comes, you're not at goal, you go out and do such and such to kind of catch yourself up. Well, I started recently just, you know, my day protocol, if I'm supposed to talk to, X, you know, 20 people today, and I'm not there, my 15th protocol kicks in, I go live. Like it's that intentional, like go live and you need to stay on live until you meet, you know, until you've um, contacted X number of people. After I go live, I go back and I watch the videos. I get the person's name that I connected with. Boom. I'm in the DM. Hey, it was great chatting with you. 
Um, you know, and people are grateful for that because again, you have all of these top agents, they're, they're posting, but they're not engaging with their audience outside of their lives or outside of their comments. They think that it's cool to let people come in on your posts and don't answer, you know, you're a celebrity, so you can't answer their posts. I answer my posts and I engage with my audience. And so on my page, it looks like you only have, you know, I don't have a million followers, but in my DM it's popping. DM is popping. Like people are just like, hey, you know, I want to meet with you. I'm meeting with a girl next week that I met. She's coming to join my company. So it's very intentional. And um, with my coach, I sit down and we look, hey, 38% of my business came from social media. She holds me to doing this. So I'm telling her, oh, yeah, I'm going to go live. She's like, how many times per day at what time? So every day I got on my calendar, go live at 9 p.m. if you haven't reached your contact goal. And that's on top of what I'm posting already. Yeah. So it's, it's not a game. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I love about it is, you know, because a lot of people will sit there and, you know, they talk about social media. I mean, most people just think it's a waste of time, you know, right? They're like, ah, this, uh, you know, right? But what you said, said 38%? 38%. Yeah. So, I mean, you're making, I mean, I, I, I got to assume that's, you know, well into the six figure range that you're making just off social media right. on an annual basis. I mean, I have made, yeah, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge part of my business and um, I had a baby last year and I kind of fell off. And so when I got like the year before that, it was 58%. Wow. And my broker is old school and he's like, Tori, you're on the internet. And I'm like, yo, 58% <laughs> of my business came from social media. So I can't, not, yeah. you know, I can't not go there. All like my entire profit share tree. I have agents in New York. I have agents in Florida. I've got agents in Tennessee, Texas. So I've got agents all over the country who are affiliated with me and who I get paid, you know, by Keller Williams, a portion of their profits, you know, and that's all, that's a hundred percent social media. And like this year alone, I mean, it's not like making, you know, I'm not really big yet in profit share, but that's t an extra $10,000 just off profit share from social media. Yeah. And, uh, I love it. That's awesome. Well, and the cool thing too is, I mean, it, it's not free because it takes your time, but you know, you're not like I use social media in the reverse, right? Like I, I, I'm not, I don't do what you do and I'm not good. You know, I need to be, you know, right. There's no excuse for me not to do it, you know, but I dump a lot of money into it, but I, you know, I'm spending like 10 grand a month on Facebook ads, you know, yeah. right. And you're crushing them without spending the money, you know, right. And if I were spending the money, I would be making a lot more. So that's something that I'm looking into for 2018. Like you've got to start paying. I mean, the good, because I can't be on social media all day either. So I do block out that, you know, that once a month where I'm doing the entire month of content and then every day it's like, okay, you need to jump on there for 30 to 45 minutes to engage with your audience. So yeah, it's, it's serious business and you know, especially with video, if you're not there, you need to get there. And it's not for everybody. Um, but if it works for you, I would say definitely stick with it. It's, it's very low cost to get into it. Yep. Yep. Well, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter free, right? So, I mean, I mean, you know, it's, you know, obviously out of a device and, and other things, but yeah, as you said, it's, if anybody's intentional with it, they can make it happen. And then like, what do you do when, Cause I'm sure there's days where you're like, dude, I do not like, I'm not, ha I'm just having one of these days where I don't want to be on freaking camera. I don't want to post like, how do you, how do you snap your, but when, but it's like that 15th, like you talked about that 15th protocol and you have to create content. Like, what do you do to get yourself in the right mindset uh, um, to go out there and create content when you don't feel like every fiber in your being doesn't want to go out there and create it? Well, Joshua, for me, I had to get very clear because I did, like I said, I had a baby last year and I kind of fell off. Right. And then it took me to realize like some people are literally relying on your post or your energy or whatever it is that you're giving your audience. A lot of people thrive on this stuff. And so for me, I just get the point that like, you can't abandon your audience. You can't abandon your audience. And if I go missing for a while, I'll come back and I'll apologize because again, in my DM, it's just like, Oh my gosh, thank you for sharing that. You know, everybody is saying that life is great and I'm struggling. So thank you for sharing that you deal with that as well. And so for me, it's bigger than social media. It's just like somebody out there needs you to post right now so you have to show your face you don't get the option you're a leader I'm a leader so I just 
I just don't have the option of sitting down or falling off. I, I don't have that option at this point in my life. Um, and then, you know, in terms of just work in general, it's not just social media. It's just sometimes I get up and I don't want to, I don't want to, I just don't want to deal today. I don't want to adult today. Um, I was talking to my team leader this morning. It's just like, what do I do? So I do a lot of inspirational, um, I do a lot of audio books. I do a lot of um, videos on YouTube, watching videos like yours. I make sure that I'm keeping what's going into my head affiliated and aligned with where I'm trying to go. So if I don't feel well, I get up, get my shower, turn on my audio book. You know, it doesn't matter what the audio book is. It's just something to get me, get me motivated. Cause you know, we're not motivated every day, but you have to, um, you have to just get your mindset. It's all in the mind, get your mindset right. And so what I've been doing, um, for the, I would say like the last three months is I just tell myself, take an action. So with social media or in just life or business, I don't feel like it. Okay. Take one action that's going in the direction of where you're trying to go. You don't have to get up and do your full legion and dial into your dialer and all that. Just take one action um, that'll get you going in the direction that you're going. And normally after you take that first action, it's like, okay, I'm already doing something. So go ahead and do the next action and the next action. So that's what I do on those days that I just don't feel like it. And I have a lot of those days. And um, this year I want to live on the beach two months. So it's like, Hey, if you want to live on the beach and I'll be working, but I want to, like, I'm licensed in Florida as well. So it's like, I want to actually pack up, go to Florida, work there, still manage my business back here in Atlanta. But I don't get to do that if I don't show up. I don't get to do that if I don't post on social media. I don't get to do it. So now it's just like, you want to go to the beach or not, girl? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So then, all right. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're growing this continued successful real estate business that can, continues to go out there and expand. And, you know, um, it also sounds like you're, you're doing, you know, recruiting for, you know, with not just for your team, but also the office, you got, you got a lot going on there. Um, but also you're a mom and you know, you have a lot of these other things going on and I, I, I get asked this question all the time, whether it's with, you know, my, from my nine mastery bootcamp clients or, or from the podcast of like, Hey Josh, you know, like, I mean, how, how do I go out there and balance this? You know, right. I want to be this great mom and, and, and be, you know, be a great wife, but also go out there and, and create a great business. And, you know, I mean, I'll try to give advice with that, but like, you know, I, I'm like, dude, you know, I, I was blessed in that I got into real estate before we had kids. I created you know, you know, success before we had kids where we started having kids. My wife stayed at home and I was joking. I said, I, I don't like, it's, it's weird. I just show up and like, there's magically like, food in the fridge in the pantry I just show up and like my clothes are magically <laughs> in the you know like I, I don't like I can't relate because I can go out there and grind 18 hours my wife takes care of the like I don't I don't have those same responsibilities and duties and different things and, and this is a question I think that so many uh, um, you know especially women entrepreneurs struggle with I mean I'm not gonna say that guys don't either but I think way more so women so how do you go out there and, and, you know, be as driven and focused and creating a successful business, but also being very intentional with the family? Yeah. So a few things. The first thing that I do is I include my children in the goal, in the plan, and I let them know what, you know, kind of the what's in it for them. And so, and not just like, hey guys, I'm mommy's going to be away, so you get to go on vacation, but we do things like vision boards together. So every year between October and December, we're all doing vision boards. And it's like, hey, if you want to go on this trip or if you want these things, this is what we have to do and we all have to pitch in. So um, my kids range from one year old to 17. Like I, so that's how the range is. So it's like, everybody's got to pitch in. Thomas, you've got to cook to, you know, you've got to cook, you've got to do the dishes. I need you to be, you know, to be responsible, make sure that your grades are up, you know, like, so they're a part of, it's not just me parenting them and telling them what to do. It's just like, you all have some say in your lives. This is your life too. And so we just have conversations. So it's just like, Hey, this weekend, 
um, we're going to go out. Last weekend we went out and we do a schedule. So I'm very intentional about my schedule and I put my family time on my schedule. So on YouTube, I have lots of videos about time blocking. My date nights, they're on the calendar. My family nights, they're on the calendar. My movie nights, my mom night, all of my family stuff goes on my calendar as well because if it's not on the calendar, they don't get, if it's not on the schedule, you know, it's the whole law. If it's not on the schedule, it doesn't exist. So I make sure that they're not um, neglected. So that part is intentional as well. Another thing that I took on last year was I used to try to do as a mom, we try to do everything ourselves. Like we just got it, you know, because we had this idea of what a good mom does. A good mom does the cooking, the cleaning, the seeing after the kids and all of this. And I decided to give that up last year. It's like, I can't do everything, nor do I want to do everything. So i um, leveraging out things that somebody else can do like housekeeping, you know, like once, you know, once every other week, husband, I'm going to have somebody come in and kind of tidy up and get things back in order. You know, that helps me out a little bit. So I don't have to beat myself up about not folding the laundry. So I do the laundry and somebody else can fold it. Um, and, and I know that some people think, well, I can't hire a maid. It's not really that expensive. Yeah. It's not, you know, I used to think it was expensive, but it's not really it's not expensive at all. I would say look into it and you don't have to do it every week or several times a week. It could literally be once a month and you would be surprised at how much that frees you up. It frees me up as a mom to just know, you know what, a few times a month I'm going to come home and the house is going to be big and span spotless clean and I've spent a hundred bucks. Like it's not a lot of money, a hundred dollars and I get to go keep working versus if it, you know, if it's just me cleaning my house, that can take me a whole Saturday. Yeah. That's the whole day. Leverage it out. Um, babysitters, you know, like if I want to go on a date with my husband, have someone come in for a couple hours. Again, these are things that I used to think were expensive. You have websites like care.com. They're, they're there. And then my husband, he works a corporate job. He works for a Fortune 500 company. And we just talk it out like, hey, I'll drop the kids off. You pick the kids up. So I think that the takeaway overall is just ask for help. Moms, it's okay to ask for help and leverage out some things to free up your time and, and just, again, be intentional about the schedule. That's how I balance it all. I don't work weekends, Joshua. People are just like, what? I, I really don't. I try, I make my appointments. My clients, they go to their doctors during the week, Monday through Friday, nine to five. They go see their attorneys. You know, you have to pay extra to go see these professionals during off hours. So I try to book all of my appointments during the week, during the day. If it's a very special client, I'll go and I have a conversation with my family. Hey family, I've got to go out to this appointment on Sunday afternoon and it's usually not a problem. Those are one-off situations, but I don't work late evenings and I don't work weekends. And that's when buyers are out looking. But if you're working listings, you're not out. You know, somebody else is doing the open houses. Somebody else is showing the buyers. So I'm home with my family. Yeah. And the goal is to get it down to four days a week. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. So leverage. That's the answer. Get, get some help. Now, when you, because, you know, you kind of talked about this, that, you know, um, a lot of moms feel like they have to do it all. And, and you know, e even maybe those that are in a position to be able to leverage this stuff out. And, 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 and I totally agree with you. This is something that I, I always train any entrepreneur on. You know, I'm like, delegate out the household activities, even before you bring on a full-time admin in your own business, because it will increase your capacity massively. And it's a hell of a lot cheaper than bringing on a full-time W-2 employee and, and, and all of these things. Um, but then there is still kind of that sometimes that guilt that, that can be associated because you feel guilty for letting up those tasks. You feel like you, you know, have to be you know, the super yeah. mom. And, and, you know, did you struggle with that at all? And, and, you know, if so, how did you overcome it? Was it just like you just drew the line in the sands and screw it? Or, or did, was it a bit of a process for you? Yeah, so I learned that a lot of this guilt and the feelings and emotions that come to not just moms, but to everybody is happening in my head. Like my husband hasn't said anything. My kids hasn't, they haven't said anything. It's all me in my head making myself bad and wrong. So I started having these conversations with my husband, like, hey, do you have a problem? So um, if I am out in the evening, my husband, before he met me, he's, he's an early bird. So he goes to sleep early. I'm a night owl. 
So I was just like, I'm a bad, you know, I'm a bad mom. I'm a bad wife. If I, if I work late, if I stay at the office one night a week and he's like, yeah, actually, if you stay late, that means I get to go to bed at eight. <laughs> so, so I had been making myself feel guilty for not making it home when he doesn't want me to come home anyway, because he wants to go to sleep. Because if I'm at home, I'm keeping him up with all of my entrepreneurial stuff. And hey, I got this new idea and all my squirrels that I deal with. And he's just like, yeah, stay out so I can go to bed. So I think that a lot of the guilt, um, and I talked a little bit you know, about this in my email to your team, it's just like a lot of what we're dealing with is internal. It's not even really there. Um, and so just ask. I would say if you're feeling guilty, speak to your spouse and talk to your kids. Hey, how do you feel about mommy being away? Like my daughter, it's just like, hey, is it okay if I go do this thing Friday night? And she's on so she's on her phone. Like my, my daughter's 14. She doesn't want to deal with me anyway. And she's like, mom, go ahead. Go do what you got to do. Um, and so I think that we just kind of hold everything in and we don't talk to our family and we just kind of battle, we're battling these things in our head and it's just stressful. It's not healthy. It's not good for the body. And chances are it creates space in your household between you and your spouse and you and your kids. Cause you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm a bad mom. And you come in the house tiptoeing late and like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. When that may not be necessary. So just communication, just talk to your family and include them in what's going on. And you'll find that you have nothing to be guilty about and that they, you know, your family supports you more than you know. Um, and so that's been, you know, powerful for me. My husband's like, girl, like, don't come home. Like, don't come home. <laughs> Um, I also roller skate and some nights it's like, I want to go roller skate. He's like, please go. Are you going skating tonight? Are you going skating tonight? He wants to watch what he wants to watch on TV. You know, cause I watch all of this, you know, I go on Netflix and watch all of these cultural shows and going to Bangkok and all of the cooking shows. He doesn't want to watch that. So just ask questions. Yep. Love it. Love it. So, um, yeah, I know, I know you're, you're, you know, you're wired to be, you know, not, not wired to be, but you are wired. Um, is just this really driven person, you know, right. Uh, I mean, do you have, I mean, like, do you have a vision for where you want to take your real estate team? Yeah. Um, so my end game is, is pretty much for me to be a, a hundred percent leveraged and for me to be out of the business. I'm like, I'm looking for um, more admin help right now. And it's like, I'm really looking for somebody who's going to run my business. I'm looking for a boss. I'm looking for someone who's thinking about growth. I'm looking for someone who has big goals. And so ultimately that's what I want. I want the business to run itself. Um, I've got a broker's license. I don't know if I'll ever go out on my own and open my own office, but I'm just looking to run me an empire, develop some other people, um, because I really like my goal in life. Now my new thing is I want to be an international speaker and trainer. So I want to be traveling the world, speaking and training about different things that are important to me, including real estate. And I want someone to run my business. So that's where the team is going. It's just, just bringing up people who are like me and just giving them, you know, giving them, being a clearing for them to create whatever kind of life and career that they want. And I want people to come to me and just say, hey, Tori, I want to make a million dollars and I want to get them there. And, you know, that's, that's, that's the game that I'm playing. Yeah, love it. So knowing everything that you know now today, you know, if the Tori today could go back to the Tori in 2006 when you first started this, this journey in, in this real estate industry um, and give yourself two pieces of advice, you know, right? That, that you feel would have just fast forwarded the trajectory of your success. What would those two pieces of advice look like knowing what you know today? Um, stop worrying about how much stuff costs, like training and coaches and whatever. I just avoided coaching and training for years. I just was like, no, my broker is making enough money off of me. I'm not paying extra money for training. I damn sure ain't paying for a coach, you know, a thousand dollars a month for a coach. And when I finally did it eight, eight years into my career, that's when things took off. So it's just like bite the bullet. These people are skilled at what they do. You know, these, these people have proven success. Just 
like don't try to reinvent the wheel just list just be coachable pay even if you have to pay whatever suck it up figure it out pay for the coaching pay for the training and follow whatever models it is that you decide you want to follow i just resisted i was like no no way and i wasted so much time so much money and literally i think eight years of my life i wasted in this business i was making money up until you know how many years has it been 12 maybe three four years ago i wasn't making any money for real and i was just you know trying to keep my you know worrying about commission splits and just just you know if you're working with a reputable broker just trust that they know what they're doing if they're number one in their market and if they're winning then lean into them and it may cost you some extra money to hire a coach with the company or whoever just pay and get it over with um that's my one um, the other thing, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my biggest, that's my biggest regret is just not just resisting stuff because of how much it costs. Like I wanted to work at a 100% broker just because, oh, I'm getting a hundred percent, a hundred percent of zero is zero. Yep. So just go pay the fee pay for the best, get the training, and then get out if you need to get out and go on your own, but you need that solid foundation. I can't even think of a second one. That's my biggest, that's my biggest one. I just think the other one is just, um, you know, do, do the actions every single day, the compound effect, basically. That would be my other one. It's not going to happen overnight. You have to do the activities every single day, and they do add up over time. Every single day, just do it whether you want to do it or not. It adds up over time, and before you know it, you'll wake up and you'll have something special. Yeah, love it. Powerful stuff. Um, Troy, where, where's the – I mean, j just basically, I mean, what you were just talking about of, of you know, like I'm a huge believer. And I, I, like when people will sit there and say to me, like, oh, you're this great, you know, real to great market. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just a good pirate. You know, right? That's all I am. I just – I find out what people are doing. They're doing it better than me. I identify what they're doing. I steal. It's R&D, rip off and deploy, right? Like I'm a, just a really good pirate, you know, right? So, you know, I know for like me, like, hey, I, I know that I want to go out there and grow my social media and do this the right way. So then for me, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I'm just going to go follow Tori and then just see exactly what she's doing. I need to read the world. Just see what you're doing and just go out there and, and, and do exactly what you're doing, right? So, uh, um, you know, wh where's the best place? For those that are watching, listen, if they want to check out what you're doing, you know, uh, you know, get in touch with whatever that may be. And, and wh where's the best place, Tori, to, to get in touch with and be able to follow you at? Instagram. Instagram is where I am. It's where I am most consistently. I'm real estate Tory. So on all of my social media ha um, platforms, I use the hashtag real estate Tory. Hashtag real estate T O R I. So it doesn't matter. I'm not active on Twitter, not as active on Facebook. Instagram is where I am. And again, when you go there, not a whole lot of followers. But not, not, not a whole lot. It's like 3,000, I think. But you go into the Instagram stories, and that's where I usually hang out. Um, that's, where I'm, that's where I am. I do have a YouTube channel, so I recruit, train, and mentor new and experienced agents. So I have a YouTube channel. I'm Real Estate Tory there as well, or Tory Easterling, where I train agents on time blocking and, you know, mindset and things of that nature because I, I separated it um, – because I was doing training videos for realtors on my social media and I'm like, I'm, I'm attracting too many realtors. So I started, I split my real estate Tory page up and then I have another Instagram page, which is agent toolbox. And that's where agents who want tips on, you know, what to do. That's where I meet all of my agents. And that page has maybe 300 followers on it. So they're separate. So like you'll go on some real estate agent pages and they're talking about, you know, starting a career in real estate. And it's like, if, if I'm looking for buyers and sellers for my business, th that that's, that's the wrong, um, that's the wrong message for that audience. So I had to separate them. Yep. Yep. 100%. So Yep, love it. And those that are watching us will have links uh, right below. I don't care where you're watching us. We'll have links right below where you can um, just click on those and connect right away with Tori. Um, so, you know, I mean, I created this podcast because I, I mean, the real estate industry is, is changed both of our lives, right? And, and in my opinion, it's, it's, 
there's no better industry on this planet, right? I, I mean, there's no more opportunity in the connection with human beings and, and the stepping stones that this creates. I mean, it's, it's just insane. And, but I wanted to create a place where, I mean, there's so much information out there and there's a lot of good information, but there's a hell of a lot of bad information. I want to create a space where we just interview the doers, you know, right? This is no theory, just the doers, people in the trenches like you that are creating success on a daily level. And with that being said, those that are here watching, listening are here because they want to go out there and create their own amazing epic life. Give me last, uh, uh, you know, piece of words or advice that you'd like to leave them with so they can do exactly that. Let's see. To create their own, I would just say that there are so many ways to make money in this business and to be successful in this business. You're going to go to a training, a conference, watch a podcast, a video, listen to a podcast, and you're going to hear something great. Just literally, literally write down and create your life, not Tori's life, not Joshua's life, not any other body's life, create your own life on paper, you know, start with who am I and go from there. Who am I? Include your family, your spiritual, your career, and then break it off into your career. What kind of realtor am I? Who am I to my community? What do I do? And then go from there. Like, don't try to be um, anybody else. Don't worry about the next new thing. It, just stay where you are or try something new and just pick something and stick with it. Just pick something, stick with it based on what you want for your life. Nobody else. Um, because if you want to go out and do for sale by owners expires, pick it, stick with it. It'll work. If you want to build an empire on social media, pick it, work on it. It will work. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. You could do Facebook, you can do Twitter, whatever it is, just stick with it. I just see agents all over the place trying to do Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and doing all of this stuff at the same time and they end up not being good at anything. Or they go chasing down the wrong path following Tori and they don't know Tori screwed up. Tori, <laughs> Tori, Tori, Tori's, trying, Tori's trying to find her way still, you know, and, and then you go chasing Tori and then you get there and you're like, oh wait, no, that's not where I want to go. So, and I did that for several years of my career. I started off my business like that, like who's number one? And I went and I went and I tried to be this person. And it's not bad to emulate top producers, but make sure it's what you want. And that would, that would, that's my last advice. Just make sure it's what you want and what you created. Yep. Powerful stuff. Yep. Love it. Couldn't agree more. So those that are watching, listen, I know in every podcast for this, but information without implementation truly is just the start of delusion. Information is the power. It's taking that information, taking action on it that creates the power inside your world so you can create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Tori shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys today. Take something that you learned, go out there and take immediate action on it. And again, right below will be all the links so you can connect with uh, Tori, follow Tori, so make sure to take action on that. Um, and Tori, I know you're extremely busy. I truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to be here. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me, Joshua. Yep, 100%, my friend. All right, you guys, thanks so much for watching. Listen, we'll see you next time.